The following program is made possible with support from the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation. Welcome to Science Goes to the Movies, a look at the stories of science and how they change our culture. I'm Heather Berlin. And I'm Faith Saley. Science Goes to the Movies is all about movies, TV shows, pop culture, and science. Today, we're going to talk about The Martian. Based on the novel by Andy Weir, The Martian finds astronaut Mark Watney accidentally abandoned on Mars, and while his friends scramble to bring him home, Watney uses all his wits to stay alive on a dead planet. Now you can either accept that, or you can get to work. This will come as quite a shock to my crewmates, and to NASA, and to the entire world. But I'm still alive. Surprise. We're delighted today to be joined by Sarah Stewart Johnson, assistant professor of planetary science at Georgetown University and my housemate at grad school. <laughs> Hello, Sarah. <laughs> Hi. Sarah, let's get right down to the important stuff. Um, do astronauts use the same kind of duct tape that we can buy at Home Depot? <laughs> it is probably the only thing we could actually afford that's in this movie that actually actually uses. Yes, you can go get the exact same duct tape that is in this movie at your local hardware store. <laughs> when you were watching the movie, were you sort of computing all the costs in your head? <laughs> <laughs> well, not exactly. As I was running through, I mean, it was such great drama. I was, you know, definitely immersed in the story. But my goodness, this was an expensive mission, that's for sure. <laughs> And in the movie, over and over again, they describe the huge thrill of problem solving. I'll never forget the moment when he said, you know, we're going to science the... In the face of overwhelming odds, I'm left with only one option. I'm going to have to science the shit out of this. That was the best part. But um, do you think that this was a good example? Do you say that all the time? <laughs> science the out of this. I do. That's like a really great catchphrase. It was just, that was part of the reason I was so excited to even see the movie. Um, the other part being... Matt Damon, Damon, of course. I gotta figure out a way to grow three years worth of food here on a planet where nothing grows. Luckily, I'm a botanist. Is this, a, is this actually a good example of how exciting it can be to work in science and especially like planetary sciences? I mean, it was just, it was so thrilling. It was like MacGyver on Mars. You don't get much better than that. You know, and it's mostly engineering, but still, it's just so exciting to see him, you know, step by step solving the problems. And you know, that's what science is, you know, figuring out the answers, you know, just taking one step at a time, which he does wonderfully. How did it feel as a planetary scientist to see, to watch this guy get all the way to Mars and then all he wants to do is get back on Mars? <laughs> well, so maybe that is one slight disappointment I have with the movie because, I mean, it is, it's, it's, it's all of the science does in a way seem like it's in service of, you know, getting away from the place we came to do science, right? But, um, but I think that it can be just so exciting, just the fact of, you know, what it takes to survive on Mars. Just imagine if you start layering in all of these really fundamental scientific questions that we can answer by being on Mars and studying it. Any time we try to do science with Mars, we have to go get the data. We have to send a mission. We have to, you know, do, there, we don't just have all of this at our fingertips, you know? And so there are people that focus on those challenges of what it would take to colonize Mars or terraform Mars or send astronauts to Mars. And, you Hold know, most of- Colonize, terraform? Terraform, so that's the explain idea. Explain what both of those would be? Yeah, Colonization well, so, and terraform. So colonization would be to sort of have a human outpost, you know, off on another planet, you know, and maybe if the dinosaurs had had a space program, they wouldn't have gone extinct. There's this whole idea that at some point we might get hit by, you know, some sort of meteor and then we'd all decimate and wouldn't it be nice if we had this sort of a backup? plan, you know, some people over on Mars. Um, so that's so that's one idea, the idea of colonizing Mars. And in, in sort of in hand with that is this, um, this word terraforming, which is to make Mars a more Earth-like place. And this is, you know, starting to be, you know, 400 years in the future, but... Like, how do you build a mall there? Yeah, well, <laughs> how do you build a planet where you can actually breathe and where you can actually grow stuff? And there's some really 
interesting sorts of ideas for how we might go about doing this. You could spread black soot on the polar caps, which would you know melt those the ices there, and that would help thicken the atmosphere and maybe help build up a bit of a greenhouse so you get warmer temperatures. And maybe you could have you know some bioengineered microbes that could do all kinds of things on warmer the surface. Warmer temperatures. How cold is it? Oh, it's freezing. It's very very cold. The average surface temperature is minus 60 degrees Celsius. So it would be nice. It was a little more balmy on Mars. You could actually you know go outside, but they're they're I mean really fantastic, imaginative ideas that, you know, people have, you know, concocted for how to actually think about Mars off in the future, the future, future, future. And, but, um, oh, go ahead. So the, there was this part of the movie in the beginning with the windstorms. Um, yeah. That's actually how we ended up getting stranded on the uh -huh. planet. So windstorms on Mars, are they so fierce that they can actually uh, make a spaceship, you know, blow over? Because I thought there was no sort of atmosphere. How can you have a windstorm like this? Yeah, so that's a terrific question. And that was probably the biggest leap the movie took. You know, and there were a couple times there was some narrative license that went into this whole thing, which is which is fine. It's a lot more dramatic to have your ascent vehicle be knocked over by a storm than, um, you know, an engine failure, say. But um, so there are dust storms on Mars, and they're huge dust storms. They can come out of nowhere. I mean, within a couple days, they can engulf the whole planet. And we've seen this from telescopes. We've seen this from orbit, where the surface just disappears. It becomes a billiard ball. I mean, there's this crazy dust that gets kicked up and you can get high wind speeds but even at the highest wind speeds you're not going to pack much of a punch you're not going to be able to knock that ascent vehicle over i mean one way you could think about it is if you were getting hit by a bunch of ping pong balls or a bunch of bowling balls you know on earth where you have a much thicker atmospheric density um, so we have a, a thousand millibars or one bar of atmospheric pressure at sea level here on earth and on mars it's six millibars so less than one percent the density of the atmosphere that we have here on earth I understand that the novelist who wrote uh, the book, The Martian, on yeah. which the film is based, Andy Weir, crowdsourced as part of his research. What does yes. that mean? Oh, wow. So Andy Weir, I mean, he's, he's just such a terrific scientist. He's a computer programmer, and he started this whole endeavor on a blog. He had a personal blog, and he was writing these chapters, you know, sort of publishing them one at a time on his blog, and he had this following, all these NASA buffs and chemists and engineers. Were you a follower? follower? <laughs> uh, no, you know, I wasn't. I wasn't in on it early enough, which is too bad. But, um, but yeah, so he, but he basically had all these chapters, and he was getting all these ideas and feedback and plot points, and people From were checking is checking his math, checking his calculations, saying, oh, actually, why don't you do this? Why don't you do that? Um, and so he incorporated a lot of this in, and he had such a following that at some point, you know, someone requested an e-reader, and so he put it up on Amazon, and I think he sold it for the lowest amount, maybe 99 cents that you can on Amazon, but all of a sudden it was at the top of the sci-fi list, and, and now it's become a book and a movie. It's so, great. Okay, so according to this movie, all that we need to colonize Mars is um, some water and just a little bit of Matt Damon's poop. <laughs> Wait, this is a science show, his scat. Um, is, will that work? Well, um, okay, so colonization, very different from not dying for a year and a half, right? And so, I mean, he does a good job surviving. Okay, so you took a lot of stuff with you already to get there, but you need to take everything with you, almost, that you're gonna need to survive. There's no Craigslist on Mars, no Amazon Prime. You can't sort of you know order up whatever you've forgotten. You've gotta be able to make a living there. And so the, when you're talking about like a real human outpost, there are a lot of long-term problems that you have to overcome. And one of those is radiation. I mean, there's so much radiation on Mars. So. Um, and it's one of the things that the film sort of glossed over. You know, they're worried about the RTG, the radioisotope thermoelectric generator, but I mean, the real problem is like all these cosmic rays coming in and you don't have the protection that you have from the Earth's magnetosphere on Mars. Um, so that is a big problem. And you know, so if you're gonna have a human colony that's gonna be reproducing, you think about pregnant women, we do not go give x-rays and CT scans to pregnant women. I wouldn't <laughs> even walk through the airport security thing. I had yeah. them pat me down, exactly. yeah. Exactly, so you have to be, um, so radiation, especially when it comes to reproduction, you know, is a big issue. So, uh, is this the, so radiation is radiation is radiation, no matter what planet. The radiation you're talking about that's all over Mars. Well, is so the we same. have a lot of protection from radiation. But it's radiation have, is the same thing, no matter. Well, so where. we got, you know, we have like cosmic rays ah. that are coming. We have all these solar flares. They're all different sources. I mean, there are lots of different sources of radiation. But and you're actually you do have some protection on the surface of Mars. It's worse being in space. Um, but still, when you're talking about long-term stays on the surface of the planet, we've got so to. To 
create like sort of that out. an atmosphere. You'd have to create an atmosphere to protect Well, them, I mean, right? what you would probably do is number one, you bury your hab in the ground. You wouldn't, um, you wouldn't have enough habitat on the surface. Where you're home? Yeah, you know, the big white puffy thing that he has in the movie. So yeah. you put that underground. That'd be the first thing you could do. And even just, you know, a meter of soil would give you a fair amount of protection. Um, you could do some water shielding. There's like, alum like big aluminum holes you could put, you know, on the journey there. Um, but, you know, long term, if you don't want to just be stuck in a cave on Mars, you know, we do need to sort of think about how we're going to deal with that problem. And that's a very real one and one we haven't figured out yet. Okay, that hasn't been figured out yeah. yet. All right, well, <laughs> Matt Damon's character figures out how to uh, draw water from a rock. Is that possible? Uh, okay, so what you guys are probably talking about is when he's trying to make water to water his potatoes. And maybe it's the iridium catalyst that you're thinking of. So basically, he's got hydrazine, which is a fuel that's made of nitrogen and hydrogen. It's N2H4. And he's got two steps that he's got to do because he's trying to make water, H2O. And so he first wants to reduce that hydrazine into this component gases, which are nitrogen and hydrogen. And he's using that iridium catalyst, which is the shiny thing that you sort of see in that dish. And that will happen you know on its own if you get it hot enough but the catalyst makes that happen more quickly um, and so then he's taking that hydrogen gas the nitrogen gas goes into the air most of the air in the hab is already nitrogen because that's what it is here on earth we're breathing you know 78 79 percent nitrogen and so what he's doing is taking that hydrogen gas which he then burns in the presence of oxygen voila you get water this is not a good way to make water there are much easier ways to get water on the surface of mars not only oh. is it sort of dangerous and there are lots of potentials for explosions and and things like that but we we've known since 2001 there was a mars spacecraft called mars odyssey that nasa sent into orbit and it was doing all this work looking at that was in it was in this orbit and it was looking at the top meter of the martian surface with two instruments the gamma ray spectrometer and the high energy neutron detector looking for hydrogen the telltale sign of water and found that even in just the upper meter of the martian surface there's tons of water there's 30 weight percent water up near the poles, which we confirmed with the Phoenix Lander. We went down, we started digging, we ran straight into a big white patch of water ice. And even down near the equator, there's a couple percent weight Oh, percent. so it's frozen. Yeah, and of it's course. also in hydrated minerals, bound in hydrated minerals also when you get down near the equator. But I mean, there are just you just have all of the soil that you have bound water in. And so why not just go get it from there instead of trying to blow yourself up? So that's maybe <laughs> another thing that you could do when you're when you're up on Mars. Way you could think about doing that a little bit easier. And in terms of the, the landscapes that they used in the mm. film, how real were they in terms of what it might really be like on the surface of Mars? Oh, uh, yes. I think in some ways they did a terrific job. I mean, the dust, I think that they, they did a nice job with the dust. The dust on Mars is so incredibly fine. It sticks at everything. It's um, it's kind of like little styrofoam packing peanuts, um, mm. and it's just everywhere. And so they did a good job with that. And that vista is not too different. If you look at pictures where the Curiosity rover is exploring now, I think the one thing that maybe they could have done a bit better was um, there's so much variability in the landscapes on Mars. And so one thing, so when Matt Damon goes up, well, sorry, when when our character, <laughs> Mark Watney, goes off to Eris Vallis, where he's going to pick up the Pathfinder rover. So Eris Vallis is covered in rocks. I mean, just rocks everywhere. When we landed there in 1997, it was just like, ah, oh, rocks. I'm surprised it even worked. Um, it's an outflow channel coming down from these high hills called Margarita Fratera. And um, we went there because we wanted to see all these different rocks that had been transported in. Um, and so there aren't like a ton of rocks, you know, in the, in the scene there. So maybe he needed some more rocks there. But then also, so when he comes back, he takes this trek from Acidalia all the way over to Scaparelli Crater, and he's crossing this um, this very distinctive feature on Mars called the hemispheric dichotomy. So the top half of Mars we call the northern lowlands. They're low and they're smooth, and then when you go over right around the equator, you transition into the southern highlands, which are ancient terrain, heavily cratered, and you don't really sort of see the difference, you know, as he's going through. Um, but I mean, it's quite beautiful the whole That's, time. How big is Mars? Uh, so Mars is about half the diameter of the Earth. So if you took all the land area on the Earth and you just sort of patched it together, that would be the surface area of Mars. And oh, when you say there's so much variability on the landscape, but they don't have trees and they don't have lakes, right. so the variability is what? It's either flat or high and rocky? Yeah, and it's in the geology. You know, we have 
really different geological features as we're, we're traversing that terrain. Um, you know, features that are really interesting for somebody who cares about, you know, astrobiology and the prospects for life on Mars. You know, Marth Ballas, which is one of these, these one of these sort of canyon he goes up on the way when he's driving. I mean, those are the best exposures of clays on the surface of the planet, which would be so exciting. Clays trap organics, and it's one of the prime, you know, targets when we're searching for life on the planet. I mean, we're all jumping out of our seats trying to send a mission to that place, and of course he's driving along. You know? You should have been on that blog. You could have yeah. given input. The whole movie would have Get been different. Get some samples right there. You're so <laughs> enthusiastic talking about this. Would you go to Mars if you were given the chance? Oh, now there's a question. You know, if um, if you'd asked me that a decade ago, I wouldn't have hesitated in a Because you have kids. You know, and it really does have a big, a big part of that. You know, my life has been so different. Um, you know, and I think that, you know, part of it is... I think about time. I've, my experience of time has been vastly changed. By, so I have kids. I have little kids. They're one and three. And, and it would my, take you how long to get to Mars? And it's that, that's right. You know, a business trip to go to Mars. I mean, to go to the moon. Three days there. Three days back. Two weeks, it's done. But to go to Mars, it takes a much, much longer time. I mean, with our current propulsion technology, two and a half years. You know, and we can potentially go much faster using iron propulsion, but we don't have that in the in the bag yet. So we're Wait, still working right. to develop it. Are you for real that it would take three days to get to the moon? That's it? Yeah. Well, how many times have you been to the moon? <laughs> Not many. <laughs> we said 12 astronauts have walked on the moon. We sent six missions during Apollo, and that's... that's Why don't we have a shuttle? Why is it <laughs> like... Because it's so expensive, honestly. Yeah, is that the only I answer? Think, well, I mean, it's interesting figuring out... We've, we've done a lot of the science we can do on Mars. There's no, I mean, on the moon, there's no life on the moon. We've gotten a ton of geologic samples that we've brought back. I don't know. I think that in some ways Mars is a much more dynamic, exciting possibility, but it is it is so very far away. What, is that what and originally got you like excited about studying Mars and whatever? Was it this possibility of maybe going there one day? Like what sparked your interest to really, because I remember when we first met and you told me this was what you were interested in many years ago. I thought, wow, that's just the coolest thing. Specifically <laughs> Mars? How did, yeah, specifically Mars. And it was like, why? What? Like, what was your fascination with it that drove you, and still to this day, to be, you know, this passionate about it? Uh, well, you know, it must have started with my father. So my dad is, a, you know, an amateur astronomer, and he did a lot of sort of amateur geology as well. And I remember when I was 13 years old, and he would drag me out. I grew up in Kentucky, and he'd drag me out of the car to look at these road cuts as we drive through Appalachia. And I just remember thinking, oh my gosh, he's, he's the nerdiest person on earth. This is so nerdy. But then I go off to college. I went to Washington University in St. Louis. And all of a sudden, this is like all I want to do. And I had this professor, Ray Arvidsson, who was tremendous. And um, he was a Mars scientist. Scientist, and he started do, letting me do research with him. And, you know, I hadn't really been very much of any place growing up. We'd, we rarely crossed the state line. My parents didn't like to fly. And then all of a sudden I left Kentucky and I was, you know, on the summits of volcanoes and I was in these deserts and I was driving the Mars rover and I was certain that this is like what I wanted to do. And planetary science is just so wide open. I mean, it's almost like being an Earth scientist a hundred years ago. There's so many things that we do not understand about how this planet is put together. And there's just so much room for creativity Activity and thinking and discovery and tinkering and coming up with these different ideas. It's just, oh, it's just so exciting. Uh -huh. That's how I feel about the brain, too. That's why I get the same kind of excitement. It's just unexplored territory that you really want to, you can actually uncover things in your lifetime, you know, not just one or two things, but a lot of, a lot of things. And which makes me think about, you know, those fictional scientists that were up there, what were they actually doing on Mars? Oh, well, so I think that the main thing that they were probably doing was collecting samples. And so you can do a lot in space, but you have to miniaturize everything. And so you don't have the full array of sort of everything you can hit a sample with. If you bring it back to Earth, I mean, you can find out so much more. And so they were probably collecting perfectly chosen samples to bring back to laboratories here. Do we have a lot of those now? Well, so we have none that we've actually collected, but we do have some samples from Mars and from meteorites. We've had um, over 100 meteorites that we know are from Mars because we can look, there are little gas vesicles and their constituents in the little bit of gas atmosphere that's trapped in these meteorites that match perfectly to the Martian atmosphere. And so we, we've got this, you know, collection, but you know, they're but mostly we don't have any Mars dust? We don't have, like, nothing came back on the Odyssey? Oh, so we haven't brought anything back to Earth that we've ever sent to Mars, not yet. Oh, we haven't? No. So everything we've sent there is still there. That's true. And so our idea is that we'll send a mission in 2020, the Mars 2020 rover, which will actually cache at a set of samples that will hopefully be brought back to Earth at one point. But we haven't brought anything back that we've at least been able to specifically pick. Do you ever get frustrated because of the time issue that 
maybe it won't happen in your lifetime that we go to Mars. Like we'll eventually go, because you were talking about stuff like, well, in 400 years, we can get an atmosphere. Yeah. <laughs> but you know, that we, you only get to go so far and not maybe ever live to the day to see someone go to Mars. Yeah, well, you know, we do live a long time these days. Huh? And I think about, you know, like if you go back a century, could we even envision sending a spacecraft to Mars? You know, what will the next century hold? Who knows? And I think the gap in terms of when we look, we had nothing when Sputnik went up in 1957. And then 12 years later, we have people walking on the moon. And while there are some very real technical and physical challenges with, you know, getting humans to Mars or even doing more science on Mars, um, I think that that gap is a smaller one to overcome than from nothing. To What's the number one technical challenge in getting people to Mars? Uh, the technical challenge, I mean, I guess, again, it comes down to propulsion. That's one thing we have to we have to really get a better hold on because the way it works now is, you know, the radiation issue is such a big one. But if you can get there quicker, you're spending a lot less time in the hostile space environment. Um, and also when you're in weightlessness, you, you're having bone loss. I mean, it's like 10 times worse than osteoporosis. I mean, you're losing all kinds of bone mass. And so there are all these, like, physical things that are happening to the human body, which, of course, had evolved perfectly attuned for our particular environment here on Earth, and once you pull the human body out of that environment, it's really quite difficult. Um, so I think that if we can get faster propulsion, I think that we will be able to, you know, overcome some of those problems. And you know, we're working on that. So ion propulsion, which is the type of propulsion that we use in the Martian, um, we've tested that on one spacecraft called Dawn that went out to look at Ceres and Vesta in the asteroid belt. Um, and so that's a different type of propulsion. Most of the propulsion we use now is this chemical propulsion. Um, it's like the 3-2-1 blast off model. You send something on its way. And, and ion propulsion is much slower. You're just slowly, slowly generating velocity, I mean, generating acceleration over time. You mentioned um, Mars 2020. Is that yeah. how close we are to going to Mars? So that's the next big rover. So there's a Curiosity rover right now in Gale Crater exploring a big, you know, about the size of a Mini Cooper. It's, you know, a Mars science laboratory doing all kinds of great experiments. Um, and so the next Mars mission that we have um, from the U.S. is going to is going to drill down and do some, you know, sort of take the pulse of the planet, look at the, the seismic activity in the planet and do some other does yeah. tw sorry to interrupt. Does 2020 mean that's when it launches and it won't get there till 2022 and a half? Oh, no. So it'll actually get there just a few months later. So, okay. um, so Mars 2020 will launch and then, you know, six to nine months later, I can't remember exactly when it will arrive at the at the planet's surface. And so that's the next big rover. Again, that's the, the size I, they're of They're going to use Cooper. the different per um, pelling system. Uh, um, so no, they're still going to use just the sort of three, two, one blast off model, and so they'll send um, they'll send the the rover up. And um, but you know you have to wait. There are only launch opportunities every so often because um, you have to wait until the planets are sort of close to each other on the same side of the sun. You don't want to launch when the planet's on the other side of the sun because that's very very far away. Um, and those windows happen about every twenty six months. So that's why so. we can't just shoot a rocket into Mars at the moment that we want to. Yes, we do have to wait until we have some alignment with the orbits. But mm -hmm. when, when do you imagine we could send people? Well, and so that's the question. I mean, it's always been 20 years away. You know, it's, you know, after when we were in the 70s, it was 20 years away in the 80s and the 90s. And now, you know, the official NASA plan is that we'll send people in the 2030s. Um, you know, so I think what it's going to take is probably a an external driver. So it might be a, a space race. You know, there are these Asian space powers that are rising, China especially. And so if China decides to go to Mars, I bet the U.S. will put a lot more effort and, and uh, money into the project. Um, there's also an interesting dynamic now, too, going on with these private space companies like SpaceX that have, you know, this very strong desire to also see humans on Mars. And it'll be interesting to see sort of the interplay and how those things come together. Simple question. Why do we want to go to Mars? Oh, gosh. Okay, so I think that you could break that down. On the one hand, there are all these scientific questions, really fascinating, intriguing scientific questions. And then there's something intangible that's separate from the science that I think ties into the heart of what it means to be an explorer. But um, so on the one hand, scientifically, we have a planet, the Earth, that was very, very similar to Mars four billion years ago when life was getting started here. But Mars has taken this really different path, you know? There used to be liquid water on the surface of Mars. It used to have this thick atmosphere. What happened? And yeah, so it's really, um, we're trying to figure that out. And so one of the things that happened is Mars is smaller and it's further from the sun and it lost its heat more quickly. And so instead of having this, um, this molten core that had a, a dynamo which generated a magnetic field, that died down 
down and that dynamo went away and that magnetic field went away, which allowed um, the sputtering from space. Solar wind sputtered away a lot of the atmosphere. And so it's left Mars, this you know, dry, murderously thin atmosphere, you know, cold planet. Um, and so figuring out exactly what happened to the Martian climate and and how this planet that was once so similar to ours took this different path is really intriguing. Um, but then it's selfishly even, intriguing too, right? Because yeah, we want to know ways. what could happen to our planet. Yeah, and again, on very, very long time scales. But I think that there is so much that we can learn about planets in general, you know, just from looking, you know, comparative planetology, the next planet over, you know, our, our neighbor here, Mars. Um, but I think that also the biological questions are intriguing, right? So we have one data point for life. We have life as we know it here on Earth. Every bit of life that we know about is ancestrally related. It's DNA based. It's all the same. And biology in a lot of ways is just, it's a descriptive science. You know, we are still so far behind in terms of understanding sort of the fundamental undergirding principles that govern biology. And, um, and I think that if we found a different system of biology, I mean, that would just be, I mean, wow, that would be better than anything any pharmaceutical company could come up with. I think it would tell us so many answers to questions that we, that we just don't know yet. And even if that life was ancestrally related to life on Earth, even if we just sort of caught life from the next planet over, um, we would have a chance to play the tape of evolution again, you know, and we would see how things turned out. And I just think that that would be just incredibly intriguing. Well, that's all we have time for today. Sarah, thanks so much for coming by. It's oh, been great. Thank you, you so this much. This is terrific. <laughs> Don't forget to check us out on the web at cuny.tv under the science tab, where you'll find past shows, additional content, and a link to our app.